friends. Welcome back to my channel. I'm Dr. Marta Perez, an OBGYN, and today we're going to discuss updates about COVID and the COVID vaccine in pregnancy and some lactation and breastfeeding too. Okay, first, I just want to review some of the known overview about COVID vaccines in pregnancy. The first thing I wanna note is like a level of busting some misinformation. So when the COVID vaccines were in their clinical trials in the summer of 2020, pregnant people were not included. So when they were first approved in December of 2020, we were getting emerging data showing how dangerous it was to have COVID while you were pregnant. That was December, 2020. Right now is May, 2022. And in the last year and a half, since the vaccines came out, Hundreds of thousands of pregnant people have received the COVID vaccine and boosters, and we have seen nothing but wonderful results showing that the COVID vaccine decreases the risk of death, severe disease, and hospitalization for pregnant people. Because of that, the COVID vaccine is recommended in pregnancy, and so is a booster shot. Um, if you receive the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, your booster should have been two months after it with an mRNA vaccine, and if your first series was an mRNA vaccine, your booster should have been five months after your initial series. So again, the COVID vaccine is safe for people um, who haven't been pregnant yet or are trying to conceive. There's no effects on fertility, pregnancy in all trimesters, postpartum period, and breastfeeding. In addition to all that safety, we've seen benefits of vaccination in pregnancy. So we know that antibodies cross the placenta into the fetal bloodstream, giving them protection. And a big study came out showing that women who received the COVID vaccine during pregnancy, not only did their babies have antibodies, but they were less likely to be hospitalized for COVID in their first six months of life, which is a huge deal and really powerful. So it offers protection for infants. We don't have data on the clinical outcomes for breastfeeding, but we know that good antibodies pass. We just don't know how it changes hospitalization or severe disease for infants, but it's gotta help. There's also some things that were precautions when the vaccines were still come out that are no longer precautions. For example, there's no need to separate timing between receiving your COVID vaccine or booster and any other immunization. For example, Tdap is commonly given in the third trimester of pregnancy and recommended for all pregnant people. You can receive that at the same time as a COVID vaccine or booster. Same with the flu shot. Okay, the most common question that I have been getting from pregnant people is during pregnancy, should I receive a fourth COVID vaccine for those who received mRNA? In other words, a second booster shot during pregnancy. And the data on that, again, right now is the beginning of May, 2022, is that right now that's not particularly recommended unless there's another immunocompromising condition that the pregnant person has. So for example, I would consider giving another booster for someone who has received an organ transplant and is on immunosuppressive therapy. I would also probably consider it for someone who has a history of severe lung disease. So those are some considerations that I would have, but it would be case by case and talking to your OBGYN provider or midwife or high risk OB doctor will help you make that decision. But for an otherwise uncomplicated or healthy pregnant person, a second booster is not recommended at this time. I will say though, that could change. And it could change for a variety of reasons as time goes on. For example, an increasing surge or a more severe variant could change the recommendation and the advice could be for pregnant people to receive a second booster. So keep updated. I'm gonna link resources from ACOG in the show notes where a lot of this is updated. So if you're watching this video and it's several months from May 2022, please take a look at those resources and just to make sure you're not missing anything. I just explained two reasons why another booster could be recommended, but there are more as well. You know, our other two very strongly recommended immunizations for all pregnant people are Tdap and flu. And what is the basis? What is the scientific and medical background for why we recommend those vaccinations? There are two actually pretty separate reasons. One, the flu shot. We recommend the flu shot for all pregnant people during each flu season, which starts up each fall and continues through the following spring. Because pregnant people are at higher risk of severe disease, death, and pregnancy complications such as stillbirth and preterm birth if they get the flu. But getting the flu shot protects them from that. And there's ample data showing that the flu shot is safe and effective in pregnancy. So the main point of giving the flu shot to pregnant people is to keep them safe. Now, we do anticipate that those antibodies 
across the placenta and also protect the fetus. But because the acute concern is pregnancy, that's why it's recommended. And that's similar to why the COVID vaccine and booster is recommended at this point. The biggest risk of COVID is to the pregnant person having severe disease and death and pregnancy complications such as an increased risk of stillbirth and possibly increased risk of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy or preeclampsia. So protecting the pregnant person is why it's recommended. And so that may be why the recommendations may change if there's a bigger surge or a more extreme variant, again, to add on another booster. Tdap is a vaccine given to all pregnant people around the beginning of the third trimester, and that is to protect babies. The P in Tdap stands for pertussis. Pertussis is a respiratory illness, and it particularly is dangerous for young infants and children. When adults get pertussis, they may be asymptomatic and not even know they have it. It's really not a big deal. So it wouldn't be a big deal about a pregnant person getting pertussis necessarily. We need to give the immunization because when we do, those antibodies cross the placenta and we have data showing that it decreases hospitalization and save lives of infants when the mom got the pertussis vaccine during pregnancy. Pertussis therefore is Unlike COVID, because in general, COVID is much more dangerous for the pregnant person and younger people and babies tend to have less severe disease. So it's kind of the opposite. However, these things can change for any of these reasons, either for infant protection or for better maternal protection after a certain time period. For example, we might see that people who received their initial series and their booster long before their pregnancy, perhaps it will be recommended to get a booster for the protection during pregnancy. So science is an evolving field, time and is evolving endpoint, right? We could never know these things way ahead of time, but I want you to appreciate that. Scientists have been studying this nonstop. There's hundreds of thousands of pregnant people who have received COVID vaccinations and boosters and answers will be out. But at this time, there's not necessarily a recommendation for a second booster unless there's another immunocompromising scenario and you can talk to your doctor about that. Another common question I've been getting is that individuals are getting COVID even after they've been vaccinated and boosted. This is commonly called a breakthrough infection. And I get a lot of questions asking what to do in those scenarios. So we're gonna go over what my best answer is. But obviously the most important conversation is with your physician about this because I can't account for everyone's unique individual scenario, but these are just some things that I think about. The first thing is it's really good news. If you've received the vaccination and the booster, the chances of you having a severe disease of COVID during pregnancy are very low, and that's very good. Now, a lot of our data about COVID in pregnancy is in people who haven't been vaccinated, showing increased risk of severe disease, pregnancy complications, such as stillbirth and possibly preeclampsia and preterm birth. A lot of those things are directly related to severity of disease. And while we don't have a lot of neonatal outcome data in people who had breakthrough infections, we can safely assume that the fact that the disease and the symptoms and possibly the level of virus in the body is probably lower among people who have been immunized and boosted, we can hazard a guess that likely the risk of neonatal outcomes and those pregnancy complications are going to be lower. We don't know for sure, but that would track with what we see for other types of diseases, et cetera. So I think that the first thing to discuss is a element of reassurance that overall you've done the best that you can and to expect that the outcomes would not be as severe as if you had not been immunized. Another question is about treatment. Now we don't only have immunizations that can help prevent COVID, we also have various therapies that can help decrease the chances of severe disease as well. Monoclonal antibodies were IV infusions of antibodies against COVID that could be used for individuals who were either exposed or had COVID-19. The problem is all of the monoclonal antibody products were very effective against prior variants, variants like Delta and Original, but not very effective about Omicron. These monoclonal antibodies went through emergency use authorization for the FDA and their emergency use authorization for almost all of them, I believe, was actually taken away because they're not effective in Omicron. There is, however, an oral medication called Paxlovid that is under emergency use authorization for decreasing the risk of proceeding to severe disease when taken orally in someone COVID positive. Just like all medications, unfortunately, this medication was not trialed in pregnant people. So when you look at the 
FDA documents, it says basically no, you know, they didn't consider a pregnancy, right? There was no data for pregnancy, so they didn't look at that. However, we want to protect pregnant people. So the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine says, and I agree, you should never withhold Paxlovid from a pregnant person just because it wasn't trialed in them. When we look at the medications, the individual medications, it's two different medicines that are in Paxlovid. There aren't tons of data in pregnancy, but it is considered to be something that um, is likely safer than having severe disease. Okay, so there's a few different ways you could look at using Paxlovid if you get COVID while you're pregnant. You can look at your past medical history, your vaccination status. I would highly encourage someone unvaccinated to take Paxlovid perhaps over someone vaccinated and the time you are in pregnancy and the effects of other medical conditions, et cetera, on you. So this is an individual decision I would offer all of my pregnant patients who test positive for COVID, Paxlovid, considering their options. In some areas, there might be somewhat of a shortage of Paxlovid, depending what's happening. Right now in May, you know, cases are starting to go up again. They've been low, so there shouldn't be much of a shortage, but there certainly was during the initial Omicron surge. And so some healthcare facilities might have a policy that if you are vaccinated, your risk is low enough that you may not be eligible for Paxlovid. So talk to your individual physician about it. I think all pregnant people should have this conversation and decide for themselves whether to take it or not. Similarly, for lactation, there were no studies of lactating and breastfeeding individuals in the Paxlovid trials. However, breastfeeding and lactation alone shouldn't be a reason that one is not offered Paxlovid. Someone can have a discussion with their healthcare provider about using it in the setting of lactation. There are a few different things I consider when I don't have a lot of data about a medication in lactation and breastfeeding that I think about. Will this medication impact milk supply? There's no reason to believe the, this medication would impact milk supply at all. It doesn't work by trying to get your body rid of liquids or anything like that. Two, does the medicine even go into the breast milk? And that's an interesting question because we look at the size of the molecule when we think about that. And in general, bigger molecules tend to either not go into breast milk or go into breast milk at a much lower rate. The two molecules that make up Paxlovid are actually on the larger end, making the amount in breast milk to be low, possibly lower. The other thing is, if it is in the breast milk, is there even potential for it to harm a baby if a baby drinks it? And so this is the question that everyone wants to know the answers to the most, and we don't have data for it. I would have a risk benefit discussion about this. Is your baby vulnerable for another reason, like being a NICU baby or having an immune issue themselves? Or is your baby, you know, pretty big now, several months old, totally uncomplicated? They could probably handle this medication since there's not really obvious risks with it at all. Um, so again, this is like something that you can decide for yourself or not. One specific consideration is that a common side effect of this medication is that it kind of causes this like metallic taste in your mouth. And so it makes me wonder, could it change the taste of the breast milk for the baby? You know, breast milk is different than saliva, obviously in a lot of ways. I, it makes me wonder that. And so I would just advise someone to like monitor how their baby's eating. Like I know that Everyone probably just wants a yes or no answer when we're discussing medication use in pregnancy and lactation, but until the FDA changes their rules and really pushes these companies to study this in pregnant and lactating volunteers, we just don't have data to go off. So I really have an individualized discussion with my patients. A quick plug, one of the ways that doctors and researchers are trying to figure out the answer to these questions since drug companies don't study it is by studying people who take medications that we don't have data on. There is a program called the Infant Risk Center that studies um, lactation, breastfeeding, and medication use. And they have a hotline that anyone can call to discuss with a healthcare professional a medicine that they wanna take specifically during lactation. I encourage all my patients to do that even after talking to me because I think they can be really helpful. And I would also encourage anyone who is taking it to call and talk about their experience. They may ask you for samples to study breast milk, so you may be able to help other people in the future by providing some samples and us getting some data. So that's a quick plug for infant risk. So if you take it to get involved. Um, I hope this was really helpful. There are um, lots of changes that sometimes come out. I always try to keep my Instagram pretty updated. And now that I'm back on YouTube, I of course will do updated YouTube videos as well. So don't forget to follow me at Instagram at Dr. Marta Perez, and of course subscribe and hit that notification bell so that you stay up to date on all my videos and have the happiest, healthiest pregnancy and postpartum possible. Thanks y'all, have a great day.